Welcome. Today we are going to talk about the collection type protocol which is available as a part of the Swift programming language. So what is the collection type protocol? The collection type protocol allows the data structures or data collections that we have designed to use the features provided by the Swift programming language. For example, the Swift programming language has a for loop that iterates through a collection, say a custom stack like I've described here, and loads each element from within the stack into an item object. As we can see from the error, that the for loop is expecting a data structure with a specific interface. In order to use this functionality, we need to make sure our data structures follow certain rules. These rules are laid out in the collection type protocols. So the collection type protocol specifies the behavior expected out of our data collections by the Swift programming language. The collection type protocol itself is a special case of the sequence type protocol which specifies the behavior of data structures that hold data in a sequential manner. The collection type protocol is what we will use to describe the interface of user-defined data structures. Remember, it is not necessary that our custom data structures conform to the collection type protocol or any other protocol. We can still have our data structures implemented and designed the way we want and used perfectly well in our projects with no problem at all. However, we will not be able to use many of the underlying features of the Swift programming language as they expect the data structures to be confirming to a particular protocol. Let us look at how we can implement the collection type protocol. Okay, so let's start off by creating a basic class. I am creating a custom stack. Uh, it uses the generic feature from Swift. So my class called custom stack can hold different elements. For the sake of demonstration, the internal implementation is just going to be a simple array of elements. Also, I'm going to have just two functions in the stack. One is to push a new element in, the other is to pop an element out. Now, let's go and make a stack confirm to the indexable protocol. For that, we first have to inform the protocol what the type for index is going to be. In this case, I say the type for my index is going to be an integer. As a part of the indexable protocol, I have to implement a computed property called a start index, which is of type int. In this case, the start index returns 0. I have to implement a computed property called end index, which is also of type int, and that returns the last value or the last index for my stack. And then I need to implement the subscript operation for my stack. So it takes an argument of position which is of type int and returns an element. By implementing these four items, we have now made our stack conform to the indexable protocol. Let us go ahead and make our stack now conform to the sequence type protocol. By making our stack conform to the sequence type protocol, we will allow our stack to be passed in to the for loop which is available as a part of the Swift language. The first step is to specify the type alias for generator. In this case, I say generator is of type element. A generator allows us to navigate through our stack. For those of you who are familiar with the standard template library in the C++ programming language 
will be familiar with the concept of an iterator, which allows you to navigate the different elements of a collection. That's exactly what a generator does. And in order to confirm to this protocol, we need to implement the generate function. The generate function is what gives us the generator. So how do we implement the generate function? Well, we first declare a variable called index and then we return an object of struct any generator. Now the constructor for any generator takes in a closure that will be used to navigate through the elements. This closure basically captures the value of the index variable and holds a reference onto it and all it does is takes the element from the array and returns it and increases the index by 1. So when we are using the for loop, the for each loop, it will be making use of this closure to iterate through the generator. There are many more functions available as a part of the sequence type protocol which you may implement but these two provide the most basic requirements for the sequence type protocol. Next, let's look at the collection type protocol. Now the collection type protocol is a specialized version of the sequence type protocol. So it also requires the generator and the generate function which we've implemented in this extension. Beyond that, I have implemented two other items as a part of the collection type protocol. One is the subsequence type. The subsequence type allows me to pull a small sequence of elements from within my collection. In this case, the subsequence of a custom stack is going to be a smaller custom stack itself. Then I implement the subscript bounds functionality which allows me to provide a range in the subscript and extract a subsequence from my stack. So how do we do that? Well there are different ways of implementing it again for the sake of simplicity. What I have done is used a basic mechanism wherein I create a new stack of custom stack and then I iterate through my array from the start index through to the end index and push each element into the new stack and return this new stack. To see how this functionality helps us by confirming to all these protocols, let's look at some code written below. So here I create a variable called stk and I call the constructor to create a stack of ints. I then push different numbers, integers into my stack and populate it. So we can just put some comments here. Create a stack. Populate stack. Now, Let's see how the generate function can help us. Well, let us create the iterator which we will use to navigate our collection. So we create it by calling the generate function. We create it by calling Then we use the next method which is available as a part of the generator to iterate through each element and print it out. In fact, this is the functionality that is used when we use the for item in stack and print each item. If we had not confirmed to the sequence type and the collection type protocols, at the very least the sequence type protocol, then this for loop would not have worked. 
to use the stack, let me put a comment in here, to use the stack in the for loop syntax shown below, we need to ensure that our collection conforms to the sequence type protocol. If our collection does not conform to the sequence type protocol, then we will have to use the more traditional for loop method of iterating through the stack and pulling each item out. Now that we've seen how to implement data structures that can confirm to such protocols, the advantages are quite clear. Apart from the fact that they help us to use the nifty features of the language, it is the fact that they promote a more data structure agnostic approach towards designing apps that is more important. Since all data structures that conform to the collection type protocol will have the same interface, our applications can be designed to be independent from the actual implementation of the data structure itself. The applications will see the same interface no matter what the underlying implementation of the data structure is. This has the added benefit of providing a standardized experience. To summarize, protocols such as connection type allow app developers to adopt a more standardized approach towards developing data structures or collection. It would also allow developers to create new APIs that can easily take in data structures that, that are developed by other or third party developers. Knowing that they would develop their data structures in such a way that they would confirm to a certain protocol, allowing us to anticipate the behavior of such data structures. Custom data structures or collections can then access specific features of the SWIFT programming language by confirming to these protocols.